I'm Adam Johnson. My wife and I have grown our real estate business from nothing into the millions and now my life's purpose is to show you how we did it so that you can do the same. Starting this month, I'm uploading a ton of free and very helpful videos that will be your step-by-step -step guide to starting an Airbnb business utilizing our go-to property acquisition technique called Subject 2. Follow along these course videos, take notes, and dive into the exciting, challenging, yet very rewarding world of real estate investing with me, Adam Johnson. Enjoy. All right, let's talk about Subject 2 transaction from start to finish. I'm your assistant, Adam Johnson, and let's jump right into it, okay? So you guys have been marketing, right? Let's talk about from that very first phone call until you meeting the seller at the closing table with your attorney and getting this house sold, you buying your first subject to passive income, cash flowing asset, how exciting is that? So first thing first, guys, you've been marketing and now the phone rings, right? What do you do? Do you panic? I know we've talked to over 500, 500 sellers have called us, okay? Of those 500, I've gotten about 200 seller questionnaires back. We'll talk about that in a minute. Of those 200, we bought about 53 houses, okay? So you can kind of see how it steps down the, the funnel that you have to filter through to get those, those yeses. You, you hear a lot of no's, lots more no's than there are yeses, as I said before, because we are a niche buyer. We're not looking for everybody. We're looking for people that need our services, and not everybody needs what we do. So... First thing first, guys, the phone rings. What do you do? You answer the phone with, hi, this is Adam with Johnson Property Investments, and you just start kind of getting to know the person. You want to build rapport. What, is, what does that mean by building rapport? You want to, in the eyes of the seller, to be a person first and a salesman last, okay? I want that person to understand that I'm a, I'm a human. I have, I, I deal with situations. I have had hardships in my life. I've sold a house. I've bought a house. I have kids, wherever the case may be. Many times, whatever they're going through, you have probably went through it yourself or you know someone who has, okay? So what I do when I'm on the phone with the seller is I just get them to start talking. I wanna ask open-ended questions. I wanna find out about their situation. Um, and whatever they say, I mean, whatever they've dealt with, I know somewhere in my history, I can, I can pull up a memory that I've dealt with and we can build that rapport. We can find that common ground. You know, um, a lot of my sellers are military. Obviously I can talk army all day long. I can talk kids. I have kids. I can talk cars. I can talk whatever. And, and even if I can't, for example, let's say a person, you know, they're all about their plants or their, their little chihuahua dog. I, my wife loves plants and my mother-in-law has a chihuahua. Whatever the case is, what I'm trying to get at, get at is you have to find that common ground, their common ground, because the, the entire experience is about them, not about you. I've had so many salesmen call me and tell me about how great they are and how many, you know, how many shirts they sell on a weekly basis. They can give me a discount, blah, 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 all the great things that they do. That's the wrong way to approach a seller with a house because we're not talking about a small shirt for $15. We're talking about a $200,000, $400,000 asset. So it's a different level of, of respect and, and appreciation and um, trust as well. So I'm just going to get you to start talking as a seller, okay? I'm going to ask those open-ended questions. We're going to find that common ground. I'm going to let you talk. I don't care. Um, I've been on the phone with sellers before for minutes and sometimes for 15, 20, 30 minutes about whatever they want to talk about. And it's been a great experience because they, they feel that um, I'm listening and I'm, I'm actively listening. So whatever they tell me, I'm also using it in my responses with them so they know that I'm hearing them. I'm not just a guy trying to you know make sure that I can get their business because I always say this, you got to be ethical. And when I'm asking these open-ended questions, I'm also making notes to make sure that, that what they're saying aligns with what I'm capable of doing and the service I'm capable of providing. You know, if a person says that they're, they're, they bought this house last year and they need $40,000 in their pocket to, to walk away, that's not my seller. That's not who I'm looking to talk to. But if a person says, you know, um, we bought this house a year and a half ago, um, we're, we're military, we're leaving the area, and we just don't want to deal with any tenants. We can't sell the house because we don't have equity, and we've heard the bad stories about management companies. That right there is who I need to be talking to. I'm going to spend time and effort. I'm going to make this thing happen because that is my seller. So you're active listening, you're, you're making notes to make sure they fit what you need, that you can provide a service to them. Um, and also, you're not just a salesman. You have to be a friend first. You have to 
find that common ground so that they, they think of you more as an individual as opposed to a salesman trying to get their house, their money, their, their whatever. So be personable, build that rapport, and be more than a salesman. Um, so what I do when, when I talk to them, if we talk for a minute, if we talk for 30 minutes, the last thing I do, I say, um, if they ask me a lot of stuff, if they ask me, I, I'm always upfront and answering all their questions, but at a minimum, what I want to do is I want to get their email address, period. That's the main thing I want to do so I can send them my seller questionnaire, okay? One thing different that I do as opposed to a lot of salesmen is a lot of people want to ask all these questions on the phone, all these important questions about this house, you know? And I, what I found early on is that when I ask you about your mortgage balance, how much do you pay monthly, and all this kind of stuff on the phone after meeting you, uh, after talking for the first two or three minutes, it puts you, the seller, on a defensive. What I've learned is me being personable and building that rapport and then getting that email address, I send them a seller questionnaire and it has those important questions in it, but they're doing it on their terms, in their house, in their comfort, without me without feeling, um, I guess, pressured that, you know, I need to, I need these answers. Now I do it for two reasons. I, I send them the questionnaire via email for two reasons. One, as I said, because it, it puts them at ease. They're in a, um, a comfortable place and their, their mind can, can relax. But secondly, it's for me. I know I can judge off of how quickly they get that questionnaire back to me, how serious they are in working with me. Okay. I have sent questionnaire and I, uh, to sellers and I've gotten it back within 15 minutes, and I, I know right there they're serious. They're ready to run and get this thing done. I've sent questionnaires to many people, and I've got either no response or got it back three or four days later. Here's what I do. When I send a questionnaire to a seller, I give them one day. One day, that's it. And I say, I, I'll text them one time, hey, this is Adam with Johnson Property Investments. I'm just checking on the seller questionnaire. Let me know if you have any questions. That is it. That's it, guys. I don't chase them. I don't hound them. I don't overdo it because as I said before, I'm, I'm a niche home buyer. I only work with people that need my services, okay? If they don't need me, I'm not spending any more time on it. At most, if I do anything at most, I may make a note and contact them in three or four months. Just say, hey, this is Adam checking back in. Have you had any luck with selling your house? If not, I'm, very, I'm still very interested. That's it. I've said in another course, um, I, Run with the runners, let the walkers stay by themselves. So if they're not serious about getting this house sold, I'm not wasting time on them, okay? So get, I, I get the questionnaire, um, I get the email address, I send them the questionnaire via email. When I get it back, at that point, I will look over the questionnaire. I'll make sure it fits my criteria. I will never, ever, ever leave my house to go meet a seller before I have that questionnaire back. I will never do that. I did that many times as, you know, as a young investor. I was just happy someone was calling me. Now I'll tell all of my students that work with me one-on-one, -on -one, do not get in your vehicle and leave your house until you have that questionnaire because you're wasting time, effort, and energy. If a person can't even get you 28 questions answered about the property that they're trying to sell, they're not really, they're, they're tiptoeing. They're not really serious about working directly with you. So um, don't ever leave your house until you have the questionnaire back and you confirm that it meets your criteria. Um, if you get the questionnaire back and and Again, the house needs eighty thousand dollars of work, and it's whatever the case may be. It doesn't fit what you need. Just call them and say, "Hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I looked over your your information. Unfortunately, at this time, it's not something that we uh, are interested in moving forward in. Simple as that. However, I do have a realtor or somebody else I can refer you to. Uh, let me just say this, guys. Even though you may not be the best uh, answer for their solution, for their problem, I'm sorry, you may not be the best solution for their problem, you can always refer to them to people who can help them. Don't ever think that, well, it's not for me. Always try to help out your callers, always. And I have referred so many sellers to realtors or other investors that may buy houses differently than what I do. Um, I never just say, well, it doesn't work for me, and hang up on them. Always try to offer a solution, whether it's with you or not because it will be reciprocated. Someone will find you. I've gotten houses referred to me from other investors for that exact reason. The house did not meet their criteria, but me as a subject to home buyer worked out perfectly. So um, always make a note of trying to help people, even if you're not the one that is best suits them for their problem. Okay. So after I've gotten the seller questionnaire back, I've looked it over and I've, I've determined that it meets my criteria. I'm then going to call that seller back. I'm going to schedule with them a, a walkthrough of the property. Okay. We're going to walk through their house with them. And here's how I conduct a walkthrough. I show up. I don't have a lot of stuff in my hands. I don't have notes and that kind of stuff because I've been doing this for a while. I can, I can mentally 
make a note of what costs what and, and that kind of stuff. So if you're starting out, there's nothing wrong with taking a notepad with you and kind of making notes, taking pictures, and nothing wrong with that. What I have found is that it kind of puts them on the defense method, uh, defense mode, because as you're walking around and making notes of deficiencies in your house, they kind of put up a defense. They're kind of somewhat offended sometimes. So what I will do, here's, here's the best way that I have found to ease the seller and also get the most out of the walkthrough. I have the seller tell me about the house, tell me about each room, tell me about any deficiency. That way, um, it comes out of their mouth and they're not, they're not offended by it because they're the ones that are saying that, yes, I, I realize that we need new carpet throughout the house. Um, our appliances are very old and actually little Jimmy tore off the handle of the, of the refrigerator and that kind of stuff. And what I'm getting at is in the next few minutes when it's time for me and the seller to sit down at the table to start negotiating and talk about things, I'm not offending them by saying that it's going to cost me $3,000 to replace all the carpets. It's going to cost me uh, $2,500 to replace the appliance package because they said that. So that's a method that we've been, I've, I've used. I've just kind of created that and it works great because it's not reverse psychology. I'm using their words in my sales pitch when, I, when it comes time to negotiate. Okay. So when I'm at the house, we're, we're, we're walking through the property. Um, before I leave, let me take a step back. Before I even get to the house and we've, we've scheduled our walk through the property, I'm already, based on pictures I've seen online on Zillow, based on information on the seller's questionnaire, I'm already formulating a sales pitch. I'm already formulating where my numbers need to be. So before I even show up to the house, I already have an idea on, um, I can close on this house in five weeks because they're moving out in four weeks or, or I'm sorry, in six weeks, wherever the case may be. I already have a plan of action before I show up. Now, when I get there and things may not be what I anticipated, yes, on my feet, I got to change and make things happen. But as I said before, that's my job as an investor, creativity. So I'm supposed to be able to think on my feet uh, and make things happen. So when I get to the house, we're doing a walkthrough. They're pointing out any deficiencies or telling me the stories about their kids and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm making notes. I'm getting them to talk. I'm asking about the family picture. I'm asking about the sports, the, the baseball game that they're watching. I'm asking all these questions kind of, again, to be a person first, a salesman last. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build that, that common ground. Um, and after we've done a walkthrough, after we've talked about everything, we've seen the entire house, I'm making my notes. Then and only then will we sit down at the table. Now, when you sit at the table, this is from Grant Cardone. You don't sit across from the table. Okay, you, you want to sit at the table, caddy corner, because you don't want you want to have as few barriers between you two as possible. Um, barriers kind of subconsciously create um, a defense. So you want to kind of be friendly and, and to start your negotiations um, and just start talking. You know, tell them what they told you as far as deficiencies. Have an idea about what those costs would be. And then what I like to do is I like to bring out a, a cost comparison sheet and I have that as a downloadable, um, a cost comparison sheet of seller selling the house traditionally with the realtor, but also taking care of these costs for the repairs that they pointed out and also paying closing costs or working with me and me paying uh, to make these repairs with no closing costs. I can show them a cost comparison on how much money they'll save by going my route. Um, I'm always upfront. I never, I do not lie. I tell them exactly, as I said before, sometimes it's in their best interest to sell the house outright with a realtor. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I've done that quite a few times. So try to be upfront and be ethical and, and find a solution whether it's with you or not. So after we walk through the house, we've agreed to terms. We've agreed that this is a great fit. This house fits what we, what we uh, can do for you. And we can take the house on the terms that we, you know, that on the timeline that benefits you, the seller, we can take the house um, under the pretenses that, you know, we're taking the house as is. We're going to make the repairs. We're going to, we're going to fix the roof. We're going to deal with everything that comes our way after we close on the house. You, Mr. Seller, would never again uh, deal with this property. And one of the sales pitch I always say uh, to sellers is, um, I don't guarantee you a timeline of how long I will keep the house before I sell it, but I do guarantee you that you will never again make a mortgage payment on this house. That simple. That line of never again making a mortgage payment is very powerful to the sellers because that's the main thing. Is it, usually money is why they're selling the house uh, subject to because they don't have the funds to sell it outright or make the repairs. So by me saying you will never again make a mortgage payment on this property, that right there is very powerful, powerful to them and it, and it takes that weight off their shoulders. So once we agree and I get back home, now I generate the contract. 
I, I get the purchase agreement ready and I send it to them. I use DocuSign, which is a, 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 an app, not an app, a, a website you can use. You can hang your documents on there. You can send it to the sellers or anybody else. And then when they sign it and you sign it, you both get a copy with the same date time stamp. It's just very easy. It beats um, trying to scan something in, sending it to a seller, then printing it out, and then uh, you know, hand jamming it, scanning back in. Efficiency is the name of the game. So we can be efficient using these systems, use the systems. We use DocuSign, there's many of those out there. We send it to them, they I always give them 48 hours. I tell all of my sellers, you have 48 hours to get a second opinion on the property, take it to JAG, take it to your attorney, that's fine. Um, but my offer expires in 48 hours. Don't ever on anything in business leave an open-ended timeline because people will just forget about it, let it go, they'll come back to you a month later. Always, always, always have a definitive timeline on anything you do in business, especially buying these houses. So once the seller signs the contract, I get notified on DocuSign, now we're under contract, and now it's really time to make things happen. The first thing I do is I go and put a lockbox on the door of the property because I'm gonna start scheduling my, uh, my um, inspections. My HVAC inspection, my homeowner or my home inspection, and my termite inspection. But I have to have a lockbox on the door so to give those individuals access to the property. And it's in my contract as well. My contract does say immediately uh, once we're under contract that I can put a uh, lockbox on the door to have access to take pictures. I have that very detailed in my contract. So. Once we're in contract, now I also got to confirm the information they give me was correct. So I'm going to request from them their uh, their mortgage information. I need I need the website. Uh, I need the login username and password and any special um, instructions. I guess you know, like some people may say, one of the questions may be, "What was your first car?" It may be one of the questions to verify you are who you uh, for the mortgage information. So I need I need the information. I need the username, password. Um, and all that kind of stuff so I can log in because I want to confirm that you are current on your mortgage, that your mortgage is $1,200, that your insurance stuff is paid because you have no idea how many times that a person has said, yeah, my mortgage is $1,200 a month. Um, I owe $200,000 in this house and it was actually not even close. They, they were paying fifteen twenty dollars a month and they owed you know, $217,000. So you always, always, always confirm the information on that seller questionnaire before you move forward. Because at this point, had the numbers been off, um, that's time to either renegotiate or cancel the contract. Do not waste time. So confirm the information on the mortgage information. Same thing with the HOA, you got quite a few houses in HOA, you wanna request the HOA login information, um, the username and password to log in again to confirm because um, an HOA can take a property. Uh, that's in their bylaws in most cases. So you wanna make sure that everything is current. Order your inspections. So as I said before, what we do, I have three separate inspections. Um, many people just do a general home inspection. That's fine if that's what you wanna do. However, a home inspector alone, he is not uh, a specialist when it comes to HVAC. And HVAC, that's a big ticket item. That can range from four to $10,000, depending on the size of the home with the HVAC unit, uh, repairs and, and that kind of stuff. So we purposely have an HVAC specific inspection to do an assessment on the property. Uh, it may cost $75, the home inspection may cost $300, the termite inspection may cost $50. All that is well worth it. We have paid for those inspections quite a few times and backed out our properties. You know, we lost $400 of inspections, but we did not undertake a negative, you know, $30,000, $40,000 problem because uh, those inspections were done. So always, always, always get your inspections done. Always, always have a contingency in your purchase agreement that allows you to get those inspections done because um, you wanna have an out if, God forbid, something is uncovered um, that you didn't plan for, i.e. big roof problem, foundation issues that weren't visible when you did your walk and those kinds of things. So get your inspections done. When your inspections are good to go, you prepare your six documents that we talked about um, in, this, in the critical document course. All six of those documents are gonna be prepared and you send them to your attorney. We send ours to our attorney. You can do it that way. I, I prepare our own documents. Or if you're not comfortable with doing your own documents, you can have your attorney do your documents. What we do, we have a great relationship with our attorney and we've done 50 some houses. So she, we're very comfortable doing our own documents, sending them to her. She will look them over. She will then uh, prepare the notary stamp uh, for them to be notarized. And if my seller, if my sellers, not sellers, my sellers are local, 
will meet at the closing table. If they're not local, my attorney will, as I said, receive the documents, uh, put her notary stamp on them, the, the outline stuff, and then she will email them to the sellers, CC me. We bought so many houses from military personnel that were out of the area. You know, we bought houses from people that were in Germany, um, overseas, uh, in Washington, Florida, all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to be local. They don't, the sellers don't have to be local in order to buy a house. You just need technology and we all have that. We all can do an email. So um, my attorney does all that for me. And what will happen is if the sellers are not local, the attorney will email the documents. The documents will be printed out, usually taken to a bank. That's where a notary, every bank has a notary. And they will, the sellers will sign the documents, the closing documents, the seller agreement, all that kind of stuff. The deed and everything um, will be printed out, signed, notarized, and then sent back to me via FedEx. Um, when I receive them, I'll take them to my attorney. I then sign and we're good. We have a, a, new, a new property, a new acquisition. Let me just say, I made that sound very simple and I understand that. There's a lot more details. There's a lot more moving pieces. Don't get me wrong. I, if I wanted to make a video covering every contingency, it'd be five hours long. Um, just want you, I want you guys to have the idea of how it flows and how you talk to people and how you treat a seller and, and, and trying to be creative and coming up with solutions and how the mechanics work of getting that questionnaire back, getting the, the information for the, to log in, to confirm the information because people are, I'm not saying they're dishonest. Some people just don't know. Some people literally have their mortgage payment on auto pay. They don't even know what the principal and interest taxes and insurance. They have no idea. They don't know what their um, interest rate is. Many people have no idea what their interest rate is. So you want to confirm the inform, uh, information before you move forward. And then, you know, once you guys have the property, now it's fun. Now you have a new asset. You close on a property. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to change the insurance policy uh, off of a homeowner's policy under the seller's name. We like to keep all of our subject to properties as rentals, whether it be Airbnb or traditional rentals. So the first thing we do is change the homeowner's policy to a landlord policy, naming the mortgage as an insurer, naming the seller as an insurer, and naming us last as an insurer, but we're still on the policy so we can make any administrative adjustments uh, that we need to do because we're on the policy. So. Once you get the mortgage, or not the mortgage, once you get the uh, insurance changed over, you go find a tenant. Um, and that's, 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 a, that's a class on its own is how to find great tenants, but it's super, super important. So that in a nutshell is it, guys. You, you market, you get those phone calls, you treat people right, you ask those open-ended questions, you build that rapport, you get that contract signed, you confirm information, you put that lockbox on the door, you get your homes inspected. When inspections come back, great. You move forward to getting the house uh, to scheduling the closing. You meet with the seller at closing table. If not, you have your attorney generate the docs for you and send them to your attorney to get them notarized and get them sent back to you via FedEx or snail mail. Um, and then you close on a property, change the insurance, uh, go into your account to go into the mortgage account to change the payment information to your checking account. Uh, I always automate everything. We have almost 40 houses right now and everything is automated. Every mortgage payment is automated. So I highly recommend automating everything you can possibly do because before you know it, you'll have five houses, seven houses and trying to memorize if you paid something, if you didn't, it can, it can get overwhelming. So automate everything you do. Um, that's it guys. That is it from start to finish. It's, it's not that simple, but it is that easy. If that makes sense. Um, I look forward to the next course, you guys. Be ready for more information coming at you soon. We'll Thank see y'all later. Watching. If you got lots of value from our free content, you're going to love the one-on-one -on -one coaching group.